You're listening to the St. John's Diamond Creek podcast. This episode presented by Senior Minister Tim Johnson. The letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain? If it really was in vain. So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, The person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You idiots! I can't believe how stupid you've been. I mean, I'm sorry to say it, but it is almost like someone has cast a stupidity spell over the whole lot of you. Something something from Harry Potter. Stupefy. No, wait, that's, that's the stunning spell, isn't it? Um, confundo. That's the one that creates confusion or um, making you susceptible to be influenced by other people. Anyway, the point is, you've all been really dumb. That's basically how Paul starts this passage that we're looking at, writing to the Galatians. Here's what he says. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? So what's going on that Paul would write like this? Well, in short, the Galatians have headed off the right path onto a wrong path in terms of their relationship with God, in terms of having a life of blessing. They were on the right track, but they've taken a detour and they've gone wrong. Years ago, I was hiking with a bunch of friends in the snowy mountains and we had our camp with all of our tents and our gear set up and we went off on a day walk. Uh, Went pretty well. We got to the destination, the mountain that we were getting to with beautiful views where we enjoyed our lunch. 
But on our way back to camp, rather than following the path that we should have, at one point we got off the track. We got off to an, onto an alternative path which led us astray. And it was getting later and darker. And at the time of year we were there, it gets really cold at night. And we simply didn't have the amount of gear that we needed to survive a night out. It would have been really dicey. So the only thing that we could do is backtrack and try and find where we'd gone wrong so we could get back on the right path. Well, it's similar to that in the passage that we're looking at today. Paul is saying to the Galatians, you've headed off the track. You're on the wrong path. And he wants them to see that there's a right path, a right way to have good relationship with God and a life of blessing, but there's also a wrong track. He talks about this at various points through the passage, but it's summed up pretty well in verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, that's one path, or by believing what you heard? So there's two options. There's the works of the law path, and there's the believing or the faith path. One of those, and only one of those, Paul says, will lead you to the hashtag blessed life, and the other path leads to disaster. So let's think about, first of all, what is this hashtag blessed life? You might be asking, Tim, why are you using a hashtag? kind of like on Instagram or Facebook, uh, you know, when people take the photo of the perfectly constructed cafe meal, hashtag blessed. Or the beautiful, the stunning views from the holiday house where they are, hashtag blessed. Or the picture of their happy family, hashtag blessed. Um, I'm not trying to mock this. It's really a way of celebrating the good life the good things we enjoy, good food, uh, nature, good relationships. Uh, these are part of the creation that God has given us, the good life that we enjoy. But Paul is really saying here that while these things are good, there's, there's more to the blessed life than just these things. And he's drawing on this idea as he speaks about blessing, going back into the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, and speaking about Abraham, whom God spoke to and said, I will bless you. I'll give you a blessed life. And through you, I want to bring blessing, hashtag blessed life, to the whole of the world. So what does this look like? Well, Paul speaks about two things in particular here that make up the blessed life. Firstly, it's about having a right relationship with God. So through this passage, Paul talks about being justified. Kirk touched on this in his talk last week. To be justified means being right with God in right relationship where God says to us, you and I are are okay, we're, we're good, we're at peace, we have a good relationship with each other, we're friends. Now, did you get that? We're talking here about the God of the whole universe, the one who made everything, all the billions and billions of stars and the intricate you know, detail of our creation. One who knows us more intimately and more deeply than anyone else possibly ever could the one who knows your hidden hurts, your deepest desires, your most private secrets. This God says, I love you and you and I have a good relationship with each other. We're, we're good. It's a sort of love and acceptance that we crave to have from other people. And God says, you and I have this together. That's a key part of the blessed life. But as well as that, this good relationship with God, deep and intimate relationship with God, the other part of the blessed life that Paul talks about here is life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, Paul talks about the Spirit right at the start of the passage and at the end of the passage. You see, God had promised an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And we celebrated that last week in our church services, celebrating the day of Pentecost when God poured out his Holy Spirit on all of the followers of Jesus. This is where the the very presence of God, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence within us to guide and direct us, to empower us to live for God and to love for God, to transform our lives from the inside out, Um, even, as we see in this passage, to work miracles in our lives and among us. So the hashtag blessed life is not just acceptance by God and relationship with him, but it's also a life that is directed by his spirit, giving us purpose and meaning. So that's the goal, if you like. This is what is on offer to us, blessing, the hashtag blessed life. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that deep relationship with God? Who wouldn't want that guidance and direction as God himself takes up residence within us? So the key question is, how do you get it? How do you get this life of blessing? Well, there's a wrong path and there's a right path. The wrong path that Paul talks about here is relying on the works of the law, keeping the rules, right? Being a good person and trying to do all of the right things. Now, in the context that Paul is writing here, he's talking specifically about the laws or the rules given by God in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible. Now, a number of Jewish teachers or rabbis had actually gone through the Old Testament and they'd counted up all of the distinct rules that are there and they'd come up with a list of maybe 613 different commandments. There were 365 negative ones. Don't do this, right? Don't murder people. Don't lie in court about another person. Don't be greedy for what other people have. And they'd counted up 248 positive ones. Do this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love other people as much as you love yourself. If you borrow a donkey from a friend and the donkey gets injured or dies, then you should replace it. So they range from the kind of specific to that culture and context to the more general and broad. And they're good laws. They're designed for good relationship with God and with other people and to care for our creation in the proper way. So if they're good, why won't keeping these rules lead to the hashtag blessed life? Like that seems like a good way to go. Well, Paul gives the answer in verse 10. Here's what he says. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Paul's actually quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy 27, 26 here. And I'll use an illustration to describe what he's saying here. I've got here a, a chain. It's a paper chain made by the lovely Carolyn in our office here at church. And if you think of each of these Old Testament laws, 613 of them, as a link in the chain, right? And you could say, well, I'm going to hook up this chain and I'm going to rely on that. I'm going to climb up this chain to reach God, to reach the blessed life with God. I'll rest my weight on it. I'll rely on it. I'll climb up it to reach that hashtag blessed life. But the trouble is this. It only takes one break in the chain and the whole thing collapses and you fall down with it. It's not that the laws in themselves, the link in that chain are bad. They're not. The problem is that we're incapable of following them consistently, we end up falling short. And you see, the point is that even one failure, 
Even one break in the chain is enough to sink the entire project. Now, if we're honest, it may just be possible to get through a whole day, sometimes, where we are really good for the whole day. But it's pretty easy, isn't it, just to slip up at various points. You jump in the car, someone cuts you off, you idiot, we scream out in anger. Or we get backed into a corner at school or at work, and so we end up twisting the truth just to save face or to protect ourselves. Or we're so focused on our own priorities and busyness that we walk straight past a person in need and ignore them for the sake of ourselves. What's more, the funny thing is that even if we're doing really well, even if we're smashing it and we're being really good people, then something like this happens. Gee, I'm, I'm, I'm a really good person. Um, heaps better than that person over there. Pride and looking down on other people. Now, you see, try as we might to be good and to keep all of the rules, we can't do it. And we shouldn't be limiting our discussion here and our thinking only to the rules that are given us in the Old Testament either. I guess what I'm describing here is how religion in general works. Religion generally is about keeping rules, and if you keep the rules, then God will accept you. You'll have that relationship with God. You know, pray a set number of times a day in a certain way. Make a religious pilgrimage to a certain holy site. Give X amount of dollars or X percentage of your money to the poor. Keep doing these things and God will say, yep, I'm tallying up your score and I reckon you're just good enough. I mean, even for the typical irreligious Aussie, we still kind of operate on a system like this. People have their own set of criteria and rules that they think that people should abide by, and they evaluate each other about how they're going on the list of rules. You know, back up your mates, recycle your rubbish, accept everyone equally no matter what their lifestyle is, buy your round when it's your turn, turn up to family dinner on Thursday night without fail. You know, we all operate with our own lists of rules and criteria, and we tend to look down on people who fail to keep the rules. And we make excuses for ourselves usually when we don't do it as to why there's a good reason why we didn't keep the rule. Or we say things like, yeah, well, at least I haven't killed anybody, and that sort of stuff, to justify ourselves. Well, that's all okay provided it is actually us who's allowed to set the rules and to set the criteria for meeting them. But the reality is, if in fact there is someone else in charge, if in fact there really is a God who made the world, who set it up as the way that he wants people to live rightly and well, who made us and wants us to live in good relationship, and if that same God cares enough about people, cares enough about the world, that he actually wants justice and fairness to reign, he actually wants people to treat each other properly, and he will judge us for failing to do that, for failing to treat people appropriately, failing to care for his world, failing to be right with him who made us, then we've got a problem. See, if we're relying on a chain of good works with its numerous broken links, it, it won't be effective. It, it won't lead to the blessed life. In actual fact, as it says here in our passage, it leads to a curse. Well, that sounds harsh. And again, our minds go to something like Harry Potter where People curse other people. That is, you know, they, they harm them or they bring bad to them. And what this is saying is that the result of not living God's way, not consistently doing things the way that God wants us to do, does actually lead to hurt and to damage uh, to ourselves, to people around us, to the creation itself. So you can see here why Paul wants the Galatians and us 
to not be foolish about this. Don't be idiots. Don't be dumb. If you're trying to do it yourself, if you're just trying to keep the rules and you think that's the answer, then you're on the wrong track and you're heading for disaster. Which brings us to the right path, the right path to the blessed life. And the thing is, it starts not with us, but with Jesus. You know, we saw that in our own strength, in our own goodness, by our own trying, the result isn't actually blessing, it's curse. So what does Jesus do about that? Well, as often described in the Bible, what Jesus does is he undertakes an exchange with us. Jesus puts himself in our place so that he takes the consequences that should be rightly ours and he gives us the good things, the benefits that he's won. This is how Paul puts it in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Jews at the time of Jesus interpreted crucifixion, that is being nailed to a a wooden cross, to be an outworking of this verse, an application of this verse that Crucified people, as well as people hung on a pole, are in fact under a curse, under God's curse, under his judgment. So here's Jesus, the only person in the entire history of the world who has lived a perfect life, who has kept every single one of the rules without any breaks in the chain. Here is Jesus who showed us what the hashtag blessed life really looks like in practice. But he doesn't just say, okay, guys, this is the blessed life. This is the way to live. Follow me and do your best. Now, what he actually does is he puts himself in our place in order to lift the curse from us. He takes the curse of our failure and the judgment that comes from that upon himself. He bears the consequence of it in himself, and he deals with it completely. So the curse is lifted from us. It's a counter curse moment. He removes the curse and he gives us blessing. The hashtag blessed life. He brings us into perfect and intimate relationship with God. And he gives us a new life empowered by the Holy Spirit, whom he sends upon his followers so that we can live life his way and with blessing. Jesus does it for us because we can't do it ourselves. And so all we need to do, all we need to do, a simple but powerful thing, one thing, is to believe in him, to put our faith in him, to trust him. This is what Paul has preached to the Galatians. He says, before their very eyes, Jesus was portrayed as crucified. He's preached about Jesus' death on the cross and its effect. So all they need to do is believe what they've heard. To expand on the image that I was using with the the chain before and the effect of broken chains uh, failing, think about this. This is, you know, a carabiner. Um, You usually use a bigger version of this uh, for rock climbing, but it's the same, it's the same sort of thing. You know, it's got that little uh, clip in it and it's used because you, you hook on to something or you hook on to someone. And you can think of this carabiner really as what faith or belief is. It's the way that you connect to Jesus. Jesus says, clip on to me. It's almost like um, one of those rescue helicopters when someone's in the sea, uh, a diver, a rescue person comes down on a rope out of the helicopter to reach the person in need. And by clipping together, the rescue person pulls up the person who needs to be rescued in order to save them. Well, that's what Jesus does. He comes down from heaven to earth in order to rescue people, to redeem us, as this passage says. And he says, clip on to me by faith. 
trust in me, unite yourself to me, jump on and I will lift you through my good life, through my good works, through my death and resurrection, up to the blessed life, relationship with God and a new life empowered by the Spirit. So it is faith, it is trust, it is belief in Jesus, which is the only path to the blessed life. Maybe this is something that you've never done. You've never connected yourself to Jesus through faith, trusted in him and committed your life to him. Maybe you've never seen the need to do that. Maybe you think, you know, life's pretty good. I've got a pretty blessed life as it is. Maybe if I just, you know, live it up, work hard, earn some cash and spend it how I want, then life will be pretty good. I'll have a pretty blessed life. But the reality is that you're missing out the deep blessing of life that is offered beyond that, an actual relationship with the God who made you, who knows you intimately and deeply and loves you and longs to be in relationship with you. And a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, where the very Spirit of God lives within you to guide and direct you each and every day to fulfill the purposes that God made you for. Maybe you've been clipping, your, clipping yourself, clipping your carabiner onto something or someone else. Uh, maybe you've been trusting in your own goodness. Maybe you've been trusting in your own religious practices. You see, Paul here isn't really talking to people outside the church. He's talking to people who are religious people, people who are in the church. And it's a warning to say, you guys were actually on the right path. You started the right way, but you've headed off track. You know, we can start with Jesus, but we can drift away and over time start to rely on other things and get sloppy or lazy. You know, we can start to think, oh, God doesn't care what I do. Or thinking, now I'm in with God, I can just carry on with life my own way. Or we can start to think that it's actually religious attendance, turning up to church or life group or reading the Bible or praying, which is the thing that gives us an in with God rather than simply trusting in what Jesus has done. Again, that's the key. It is clipping ourselves, connecting ourselves, trusting in Jesus, that is the only way to the blessed life. It starts that way. That's how you enter into relationship with him. But it's ongoing. It's continuing day by day as you entrust yourself to him in every situation and every day. And as you seek to live his way, living your life empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's a great way to start each day to ensure that we're doing this. All right? When you swing your feet out of bed in the morning and as they first touch the floor, or maybe as you're looking yourself in the, in the mirror, shaving or getting ready for the day, putting your makeup on or whatever, start the day by saying, Jesus, I trust you and I'm going to trust in you this day. It's not my strength and my goodness that's going to bring me blessing. It's only your perfect life, your death on the cross and your resurrection that can give me the blessing that I need. So I'm uniting myself to you today again, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit so that I can walk your life today. Help me to love you with my whole heart. Help me to love other people the way that you want me to. If I try and do this in my strength, I know that I'll fail. But in your strength, empowered by your spirit, relying on you, Jesus, I can do it. So lead me into your blessing today. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Just search for St. John's Diamond Creek. 